So I think we've talked about this. It's, you know, when you're starting out, you've got to find an aerobic compost. What organisms do you need in your soil? You can't know what compost you need if you don't know what's missing in your soil. So what's the right compost? So you know, find out, well, what does your plant need? What's the plant you want to grow? So you know what organisms that you want to reach. What's your goal? You need to know what's there. You need to know where you need to get. Because that could be massively different. You know, as we go from, I just remembered, we got the, the weeds, we got the brassicas, we got the veggies, we got the row crops, the uh, pastures. As we go into shrubs, into perennial plants, woody perennial plants, it's fungal dominated. We go over that edge and we have to have more fungi than bacteria. When we get into um, deciduous forests, we've got to have a hundred times more fungi than bacteria. When we get into old growth conifer systems, we have to have a thousand to 10,000 times more fungi than bacteria. When we get into the most productive ecosystem on this planet, 85% of the weight of the soil is fungal biomass. So when you look at that little chart that the USDA always shows you where, you know, here's, you know, the percentages of the volume of the soil and you have this little tiny sliver, 5% of the weight of your soil is biology and organic matter. Throw it out the door because all they've been looking at is dirt, not soil. Once you get into soil, you, we increase through the course of succession. The percentage volume or weight of your soil becomes more and more and more and more biology, more organic matter. To the time when we get into the most productive ecosystem on this planet, 80, 85% of the weight of the soil is fungus. When you go out into, um, this is work that Paul Stamets and I have been working on for some number of years. Um, the ecosystem is the um, old growth cedar forest on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. In the springtime, as the snow melts, you go out and you push any small amount of uh, litter material sitting on the surface of the soil back. All of that is bound together by fungal biomass. When you take up a piece of wood, all the other pieces of organic matter, debris, residue sitting on the soil surface comes with. And a lot of the soil will come. When you stick your fingers into that soil and you try to pull it up, it's almost impossible to get just a little tiny amount of that soil because handfuls come with all at the same time. It is all bound, all held together by fungi. So you know, early springtime, late winter is just amazing the fungal biomass. So when we've gone out and dug in that system, it is a single individual of fungus 20 miles wide and goes down at least 25 feet. We stopped digging at 25 feet because we didn't have any equipment to go deeper. We needed the uh, oil company there to, you know, do the old, uh, yeah, dig deeper. <laughs> so we stopped there. This ind single individual is the size of about eight to 10 blue whales. It is the largest organism on this planet. And as other people in other forest systems start exploring more and more, they're all in look of these ginormous individuals. The largest organism on the planet is a fungus. There's another one that lives down in the Amazon. There's another one that lives in Japan. There's another one that lives in Finland. There's uh, one in Norway, Sweden, um, all over the world. We're starting to find them when we look in these highly productive ecosystems. But as soon as the predators in the springtime wake up, their favorite food, flying squirrels in the Pacific Northwest, when you're talking about ground squirrels, when you're talking about the microarthropods, the voles, the shoes, the mice, they wake up and they go, whoa, look at the party. And by the time June comes around, you can barely find any remnant pieces of this great big mat of fungal biomass. Yeah, and you look over here, yeah, this is the same individual as over there, but all of this got eaten. Think of the nutrient cycling going on in that forest system. How do we supply the nutrients to have those great big ginormous trees stay alive? How do they get the nutrients every year? 
there are more nutrients sequestered in that plant material in those old growth forests than any agricultural field on the planet. We have removal, sequestering of more carbon in those systems, more mineral nutrients tied up in the biomass of the plants on an annual basis than any agricultural system on the planet. So how do those old growth forests stay alive? Nobody's out there putting on fertilizers. Nobody's out there putting on mineral nutrients. And yet every year, we're putting away more nutrients into that plant biomass than any place else on the planet. It's because it's coming from the rocks, the pebbles, the sands, the silts, of the clay. Until the day you run out of bedrock, don't worry about nutrients. It's in your soil. It's the life. The only reason the Green Revolution worked is because we had already destroyed the life in the soil. Put the life back, we don't have to do that. So how are we going to get these organisms back into the soil? So we need to know what's in the compost. Now, what foods? Could we just put foods out on our soils? If our inoculum, if the organisms are present in your soil, then maybe all you have to do is put foods out. So go out with your sprayers and put on humic acid. Go out with your sprayers and put on the kelp and the um, foods to feed those fungi to move them along in the right direction. Well, if you don't have the biology in your soil, so here you go. you got to go back here. Do you have enough fungi in the soil? No? Then we're going to have to be putting the compost out. And it's easy of course, easier, of course, to put the compost, the organisms out in a liquid form than a solid form. So how much food to add? How much do you need to grow the fungi? So see, I can't stand up here and tell you you are always going to put two cups of fungal food into your compost tea brewer because what if you have no fungi at all and or such a low level that you're going to have to put way more or maybe you already have a decent amount of fungi so you really don't have to grow that much just got to get an inoculum out there so see some of the problems here this is um not a system for people who don't want to think which a lot of the chemical farmers, I think we can say exactly that about them. They don't want to think. They just want to be told by their agronomist what to do. And your agronomist is probably not interested in this information at all because uh, he doesn't have a job if you start following this approach. So that agronomist might have to become a soil food web advisor so he could still have a job. So we need to see that transition. If you have no protozoa, we can make a protozoan infusion which is a version of a compost tea, really. Except the place most protozoa go dormant are on the stems of the grasses. In a meadow, in your lawn, as your grasses grow dormant in the summertime, the protozoa that were running up and down the stems of your grasses out there on the leaves of your grasses chasing the bacteria and the fungi that grow on those surfaces. When it starts getting dry... The protozoa go, there's not enough water here, so I'm going to go to sleep. And they just go into a dormant stage, a cyst form. So if you mow your grass, keep it dry, store it away, keep it dry. Then when you need protozoa, you take a handful of that, put it into your five-gallon bucket, fill the bucket up about halfway with water. Please make sure you take care of the chloramine and the chlorine. So rain water, rain barrels, good place to get your water from. So the bacteria on the surfaces of that grass material wake up in the first 12 hours. The protozoa go, hey, guess what? There are bacteria in the water. I can wake up and I've got something to eat. So your protozoa wake up. After about 36 to 48 hours, you got billions of protozoa running around. So take that and put that out on your soil if you lack the predators in the system to get nutrient cycling going. So really simple, easy way, you know, you just need a little air bubbler to keep it aerobic in that bucket. So we can add back things like that. So I you know, want to do a few little pictures and then I'll go into these examples. Now, I've been telling you about starting with aerobic compost. So here's a client that we were working with and we were emphasizing this information to them. Um, what would you say about that compost? Look at the little air pipes that they're trying to get oxygen down into the middle of. The color of the middle of that compost is black, not brown. Black means it's gone anaerobic. 
You've turned your carbon into charcoal, which is black. You go anaerobic and any of your soluble inorganic nitrogen is going to be turned into ammonia. It's a gas and you're going to lose your nitrogen. Say goodbye. Don't go anaerobic. We do all these ferments. You go anaerobic. What happened to your nitrogen? It's not there anymore. When you go anaerobic and you get that ammonia being produced, a black color is left behind. As we go anaerobic, any of your soluble inorganic sulfur is going to be converted into hydrogen sulfide, which is the smell of rotten eggs. And it leaves behind a black color. Think about swamp gas. Well, that's what we're talking about. That's ammonia and the rotten egg smell plus a few other wonderful acids. So when you see black color in the inside of a compost pile, it's not compost. Turn around and walk away. It is not worth the money that you're going to pay for it. They should be paying you to take it away. Because you're going to have to resuscitate it. You're going to have to get a good compost and get the biology back in there along with some foods for those organisms to be eating because the carbon got turned into charcoal. That is not a food resource for any microorganism. Biochar. Is there any food in a biochar for my, our, my, our microorganisms to grow on? You're going to have to add it. So, yeah, biochar might be a way of, you know, putting carbon into the soil and it's not going to go away very rapidly. But if you want to make it a medium that will allow your plants to grow and, oh, yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't we like that to happen? We're going to have to put the biology back in there and we better grow some plants in it so we get the foods to keep your organisms alive. Biochar? You're going to have to put the biology back into it. So is that biochar? What should we be calling biochar? Charcoal. Exactly, you got it. So if they soak the charcoal in a compost tea, all these wonderful organisms move into the condominium housing in your charcoal, and now it's biochar. It's not biochar until you put the biology back in there. So hype has happened once again. Why should we be surprised? So, and then somebody else, when, uh, when I was pointing out the air pipes, somebody else was saying, look at all the grass growing on the surface. What's the um, ratio of fungi to bacteria in this compost pile? Look at the weeds that are growing on it. Yeah, so sometimes, quite often, you can tell what is in that soil because of the plants that are growing there. If what's growing there is a whole lot of weeds, you can tell me now. What's uh, the ratio of fungi to bacteria in there? Strictly bacterial. We've got some poa growing on here. Okay, we got some fungi in here, but probably not what we want to grow a good, healthy pasture. They need to work on this. They need to fix this. So, um, you know, compost. So these guys are out every morning checking every single windrow. What's the temperature? Do they need to turn it? So you can see the two piles, three piles that needed to be turned on this particular day. So along comes the turner, runs through it, gets the oxygen back in there. They'll cover it back up. So uh, preventing evaporation in the middle of the summertime, preventing water logging when we're in a rainy t part of the year. And so um, typically halfway through the day, they all go out and start taking their starting materials and build more piles. You always can't go from the oldest piles to the youngest piles because you do not want to be contaminating your compost by going from something you're just hauling around manure back into a compost pile that's almost finished. So you wash your, your instruments at the end of the day. So all of these um, um, mechanical um, appliances uh, get cleaned at the end of the day. And then the next morning, you're ready to start all over again. So they make some fantastic compost up here. So, you know, recipe guidelines. I think most people are probably interested in this. You want to really look at your brewer. Um, if you don't have a lot of aeration, you only want to add a total amount of food that's about 0.101%. You can't be adding a lot of food if you don't have really good aeration. So in a 500 gallon tank, you're only going to be putting, you know, five tenths of a gallon. You're putting a couple ounces total of the food going into your, um, into that volume of water. Because if you don't have good aeration, 
you can't be feeding them much food because they just go bonkers. They go crazy. Your bacteria and fungi, woo, can they grow? How rapidly do bacteria reproduce? It takes typically about 20 minutes for bacteria to go from one to two, two to four. You know, every 20 minutes they're replicating. Fungi typically take about three hours in a tea brewer. So you're not going to get as much fungal response. So you have to be really careful. If you already got all the bacteria you need, don't put anything in that's going to be growing bacteria. You want to put in things that are strictly fungal foods. If aeration is moving your surface pretty well, well, then you can increase the amount of food by a factor of five. If you've got that rolling boil on the surface of your soil, then we can be putting in 0.1%. We could be putting a whole gallon into a 500-gallon brewer. But that's a sum total of, you know, if you're putting kelp, if you're putting in humic acid, if you're putting a little bit of oatmeal in, the sum total are these rates. A maximum of one to five gallons of food, you know, no more ever under any condition, or you're going to be going anaerobic during the tea brew. So if you're doing a 50-gallon brew, well, just reduce that by a factor of 10. If you're doing a five-gallon brew, yep, you reduce that by another factor of 10. So just giving you some guidelines of what, where to start. And then once you make your brew, you check the biology and see what actually grew. Somebody comes along with, oh, yeah, this material grows great fungi. How do they know? Where's their data? Have them show you what they did. Oh, trust me. Yeah, turn around and walk away. Trust me. (laughs) Have we not learned anything from uh, my favorite company in the world, Monsanto? Why would too much food make a compost tea go anaerobic? Because remember, as the bacteria and fungi grow, they're using up oxygen. The more rapidly they grow, the more individuals you have growing, the faster you're going to use up oxygen. And in a tea brew, we can very rapidly outpace the aeration that we're doing. I'll show you some data. In just a, hmm. Did you say that the fungal biomass can double in three hours? Yep. Yeah, fungi reproduce um, every three hours. So one cell of fungal hyphae will become two cells. This guy will branch and now, yep, exponential growth. So fungi can be right up there. Not quite as much as bacteria, so we want to feed fungal food. So here's a typical fungal recipe, just to give you an idea. The compost has to have this level. You want to see at least 300 micrograms of bacteria in our compost. High diversity, we want more than one species. We want to see, you know, like 16 species that we can pick out through morphology. We want 300 micrograms of beneficial fungi, wide diameter, colored, oxalate crystals on the surfaces. We want uh, 10,000 flagellates and amoebae, no ciliates at all, please. Ciliates are the anaerobic stages, the anaerobic type of protozoa. So you see a ciliate, Mother Nature is trying to tell you, you're going anaerobic, do something about it. Up your aeration, reduce the amount of food. A few beneficial nematodes. Nematodes will not reproduce in a tea. You're going to extract them. We'll have whatever was in that compost in the tea or in our extract. They don't reproduce in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, Nematodes take a a minimum of at least uh, a week to reproduce. Flagellates and amoebae will reproduce once every eight hours. So yes, we will increase our protozoa when we're doing a tea brew. So extract into the water. You know, so now here's a typical fungal recipe. 500 gallons of water two cups of kelp, one gallon of humic acid, or one gallon of fish hydrolysate. So right there, that's kind of maximum. We're going to be growing a lot of fungi with that. So just to give you an idea, where to start. If you're kind of concerned that my compost tea is going to go anaerobic, reduce this by half. Be safe, not sorry. Question back there. Um. I don't just say, don't use molasses. I say, why? Why would you not use molasses in a tea brew? What does molasses grow? Bacteria. Bacteria. Really well. In a typical non-sulfured, so if you are going to use molasses, make sure it's non-sulfured. 
If you've got sulfured molasses, what, what are we adding the sulfur in there for? To kill microorganisms. It's a preservative. So sulfur in any form is a fungicide. And so sulfured molasses, we're trying to prevent the growth of the fungi in that molasses. So we must buy non-sulfured blackstrap molasses. Blackstrap because we want lots of different kinds of sugars, so we will grow a massive diversity of different kinds of bacteria. But it is strictly a bacterial food when we add it into a tea. Do you need more bacteria in your soil? Think about what we've been doing with agriculture for the last 150 years. We've been destroying the bacteria. We've been destroying the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, the way we till, the way we manage. Conventional agricultural systems selects for strictly bacteria. Do you need any more bacteria? Probably not. So that's why I say don't use molasses. We already have too many bacteria. That's not what we need to be enhancing. What we need to be enhancing are the fungi, protozoa, the nematodes. So that's why you'll hear people say, Elaine says, no molasses. That there's a reason for no molasses. Okay? So selecting a good machine, we've kind of been through this. So I'm going to just let you go ahead and read through that really quickly. You know, look inside the brewer. If there's any parts that you're going to have to take out and clean. If there's any holes, you're going to have to get in there and clean those holes. Pipes, you're going to have to open up the pipe. You're going to have to clean the inside of the pipe. I don't know about you, but I am not interested in working that hard. So typical brewer. Air pump. Notice that the uh, the, uh, pipe, the air pipe goes up to the top and then back down because if the electricity goes off, we don't want the water from the pot, from the tank backing up and destroying the air pump. So simple little um, valve on the bottom so you can close this or open it. And a simple cone tank. This is a dirt simple brewer. And yes, it is dirt simple. There's the compost bag. So mesh size, 400 microns opening size. You would close the valve. You would fill up however much tea you need to make. So in a system like this, you can be making 20 gallons or, um, you know, 50 gallon, whatever. You don't have to fill a tea brewer like this up completely full. Once you've got the water in there, you're going to add your humic acid to deal with the chlorine and the chloramine. Start the aeration. Open, you know, start the pump. Open up the valve. Now bubble, bubble, bubble. Make sure you're getting a rolling boil on the surface of that water. If we're making tea, we're going to add foods at this point. Every one of our um, food resources that are going in here is probably going to have a preservative in it. And we must dilute the preservative. So add those materials that are stabilized. They came in a sealed container. How do you prevent microorganisms from growing in fish hydrolysate? Yeah, you're going to have to drop the pH to a really low level. And then that means you have to dilute that low pH by adding the fish hydrolysate to the water before you put any organisms in there. We don't want anybody dying. So the foods go in first, and then you put your compost in your bag. In a brewer like this, we're going to be using a couple pounds of compost. If it's really good compost, we could probably get away with putting one pound of compost. If it's, eh, you know, we may be missing a little bit and the inoculum's not quite there, we might be putting five pounds. If it's really not so wonderful compost, there's not much of anything in there, you might have to use 10 pounds in here. But we're going to put that bag so it um, sits right in the flow of those air bubbles coming up. So extracting... The vortex in this particular brewer is set up so that air bubbles coming from the top, the water itself comes around, hits the sides, and then dives back down. So there's the vortex. If you look down on this from above, the bubbles are coming straight up the middle. The water goes around to the side, so it's a torus. So we have a really good vortex going in here. 
extracting the organisms out of the compost into the water, extracting any of the soluble foods in that compost into the water. Of course, if it's an extract, we don't have to put the foods in. We just extract and then we're done. Ta-da! Not difficult. So you got to be looking at your compost. What's the biology in there? How much? Is it one pound? Is it five pounds? Is it 10 pounds? Shouldn't be, you know, on a brewer this size, we don't really need that much compost, hopefully. So it's a way of increasing the organisms in your compost, getting them out there, actively growing. Question here? He's asking about air stones. The response is don't. Absolutely do not use air stones. You would have to replace them after each brew. There is no way to prevent the organisms from getting on those surfaces inside the air stone. And so in the time between this brew and the next brew, that air stone dries down. Well, the organisms growing in those very uh, you know, secluded spaces, oxygen is not diffusing in there very rapidly at all when the air stone's off. And so it goes anaerobic. So your next brew, you use that same air stone. What do you put it into your uh, brew? Some really nasty, toxic, possibly pathogens. No, air stones, don't. Do not do that. There is no way to clean an air stone so that the inside part of that air stone doesn't have the anaerobic biofilm in it. You want to prove that one to yourself? Break the air stone open. See the black layer inside there? Black layer? What does that mean? Oh, the smaller bubble issue. Yes. Um, talk to a, a, a person who really understands the air bubbles and exchange surfaces. It is not the size of the bubble as it's rising up through the water column that has absolutely almost no bearing at all on oxygen exchange into the water. The place all the oxygen is exchanging is in the rolling boil on the surface. That's where oxygen is being entrained. It's, you know, little bubbles, big bubbles. That is not the important thing. Yes, there's some oxygen exchange there, but you know, come on. This is where most of it's happening. So have some fun talking with aeration experts on this one. Really, the reason we're bubbling from the bottom is to get your water moving. So we're getting the extraction with the speed that that water starts to move around. And the place where most of the oxygen is being entrained is up here. So as your water is going by, air is being entrained, and then your water dives down to the bottom. Round and round and round it goes. So I don't care what size air bubble. That's a past silliness. That's mythology. Um, okay, we all learn things. I need to finish this. I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to stop on the questions. I'm just going to ignore your hands until the end. Sorry. So a slightly bigger tea brewer, the only thing that really changes here is you might be adding a little bit more food and you're going to use a little bit more compost. So in um, something that's a 100-gallon brew, you might be using uh, 5 pounds of compost if it's really good, um, 7 pounds if it's kind of okay, um, 15 pounds if it's really not real wonderful. You know, so how do you know exactly what you need to be using? Microscope. You take a drop of your compost tea, put it on your microscope slide, cover slip under the microscope, and you look through there and you go, yes, look at all those critters running around there. They're just having the greatest time. There's a fungus there. There's a fungus there. There's a fungus there. Yes, got it. Or you take a drop of your compost tea, you put it on the mic drop on your microscope slide, cover slip, stick it on the microscope, and you go, there's nobody home. <laughs> okay, you don't have compost. There was something dreadfully wrong going on. So it's that easy. It takes you five minutes to do these, this kind of work. You don't have to be perfect about identifying anything either. People get so anal. I got to know what every little piece is in here. I don't know what every little piece is. So not what we need to be worrying about. So here's another brewer. Um, you know, you can get these uh, totes uh, often for free or for a very low price. This, the unit comes with the air pump here. Um, the air goes down to the bottom. This is where the actual aeration. And, uh, of course, then the air bubbles are going to come straight up and out the surface. Nice bubbling, nice um, rolling boil on the surface. The water then, of course, comes up, goes sideways, and dives back down, and you set up the vortex. The uh, compost bag, oh, excuse me, it's the microbe liberation chamber. <laughs> 
So Bob Postuma, who built this one, great. Um, so the combo sits in the bag. Uh, there's a pipe that goes to the bottom and then a crossbar with little holes in it. So you're aerating the compost in there. And so really excellent extraction in this kind of tea brewer. Uh, and it is pretty easy to um, clean because there's quick release valves here and here. Um, those parts come off. It's a lot easier to open up the um, uh, openings at either end of that pipe, run a cloth through that. It's pretty easy to clean. It's going to take longer to clean this machine than it is going to take cl to clean this machine because there's absolutely nothing in the inside of the tank. At eight hours, you're going to take the compost bag out Dump any compost that's still in the bag back on your compost pile. Go stick your um, bag in your dishwasher or your washing machine, whatever, um, so it's clean and time for your next tea brew. When you are finished with the tea brew, of course, you're going to um, close the valve at the bottom, then turn off your air pump, hook up your um, sprayer pump, and open the valve and pump your compost tea into the sprayer. Or if this is up on a platform, you just open the uh, valve and let it run straight into your sprayer. That's my favorite way to do it. Just gravity works. So the tea goes in. While you're standing there watching your tea go out, have your um, hose and uh, finger in the end of the hose and blast the any biofilm off the surface, make certain that the, val the um, valve down here, that opening, you're going to have to blast that a bit. So high pressure washer that you might want to buy from Kmart or Walmart or anything. Um, it's simple. You're clean. You let it dry. You're ready for the next one. With this one, you are going to have to be cleaning the stainless steel, but stainless steel is pretty easy to clean. It blasts off pretty well. So, you know, you're going to spend the time it takes for the tea to drain out of here is the time you're taking to clean this unit. This is probably going to take you a good half hour to clean the inside parts, which is not bad. It's too much for me, but uh, um, so there's the compost in the bag and we're just going to hook it up to the and you can see that rolling boil. On the surface of the water, that's the kind of movement on that surface that we want to see. Adding the foods, we did that the wrong, you know, but it's demonstration purposes. Add your foods first, then put your compost in there. Um, there's dairy tanks. So um, when um, these are on sale, uh, you know, dairy tanks, they are curved surfaces inside. So there's no 90 degree corners. Here's their aeration. It's just simply the air gets pumped to the bottom. Big, long PVC pipe with holes punched in it. Yes, every once in a while they forget or the power goes out and the tea ends up inside their PVC pipe and then they're going to have to clean that out. That is not fun. So it's going to take a you know, good four hours to clean it when uh, a snafu happens. So yeah, but still. You could, you could do this if you've got the manpower. This kind of system, again, old dairy tanks, smooth surface at the bottom. You want to have the aeration going in at the bottom. When we first started working with these people, they had um, disc diffusers on stands. So they had um, air pipes coming down the sides, lattice work across the bottom. They had about eight of these disc diffusers down there. But the disc diffusers sit up about a good um, four inches off the bottom. So here's your air going up, hitting your compost. Comes The water then comes around, but it goes under the disc diffusers and drops off any sludge. So that was a real problem. They could not make good tea. They were not um, being able to get rid of some of their problem organisms. So we had to make certain that from the bottom of the tank, that's where the air is coming up. So we had to drill through the bottom and basically put a number of little nozzles all over the bottom so that they wouldn't get that sludge layer forming on the bottom of that tank. So think through the design on this um, number of people. Anybody at any one of the SFI laboratories could probably help you build these um, and do it simply. 
Um, I can talk to you about lots of different places that we've worked. I can't go into detail because I'm running out of time.